I'm Rosalind Corita, and I'm at one of my favorite places in the whole world. I'm at Fort Campbell, I'm at the Pratt Museum. And if you look behind me, you kind of wonder what could this be? Did you know that there were prisoners of war that were right here at Fort Campbell? This was a German POW camp. Stay with us, we're gonna learn a little bit more about how it came to be that we actually had prisoners of war right here in Clarksville, Tennessee at Fort Campbell. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Have you ever been hungry, worried about where you're gonna get your next meal? Loaves and Fishes is an organization feeding the hungry. Primarily through volunteer efforts and donations, we are able to accomplish this mission. Loaves and Fishes provides a midday meal Monday through Saturday year round. We provide food to agencies helping the needy through our distribution program. If you would like to donate, get involved, or for more information, you can find us on the web at www.loavesandfishes.com tn.org. Please help us with our mission of feeding the hungry. I'm here with John O'Brien, and he is the installation historian, but he also has other roles. You actually teach at Austin P. You have some connection with Austin P. that helped us learn about this. Yes, I'm a member of the adjunct faculty in the history department, and the history department chair, Dr. Dewey Browder, uh, gave us a lot of help putting together an intern program a public history intern program that is taught here at the museum. It's wonderful. Where the students learn how to do public history and they learn how uh, to construct museum exhibits mm -hmm. and how to do the, in particular the research that goes behind putting an exhibit like this together. Mm -hmm. So this is a cooperative effort with interns uh, that are in my class uh, Public History 4940 at Austin P, a semester-long program. And in this particular exhibit, we had a wonderful opportunity to work with a faculty member uh, at Austin P, Dr. Antonio Thompson, who is a recognized expert on this whole experience that the United States had in World War II mm -hmm. with bringing German and Italian prisoners uh, here to the United States. And uh, his research allowed the students to meet with him uh, and use him and his research as the background for putting this exhibit together. So you actually put the students with this expert? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so you had, had Antonio Thompson come in and speak to them? He did, yes. That's a wonderful opportunity. And so then, then they took, they began the research. So tell us how that kind of started. What well, the, the research and then exhibit design. The elements right, of exhibit two. design go together. So it's, it's like writing a book. That's mm -hmm. why we love having history students for our interns, because it's like conduct, constructing a, a 3D book. So they, they went together here, and you know the, the first question is, why were there POWs from World mm -hmm. War II here in Fort Campbell, or at that time Camp Campbell, Kentucky? Mm -hmm. And in their research, what they came up with was, if you remember our, our World War II history, Eisenhower invaded Africa, and our first land battles on the European continent are in Africa. And several American divisions fought there against the German Africa Corps and the Italian divisions that were part of the Africa Corps also. Okay. Okay. Eventually, by, the, by 1943, we win the Battle of North Africa, and there are a tremendous number of prisoners that have been taken, both Italian and German. Okay, and so this is at the first part of the war. It is, yeah. And how many, do we have any idea how many prisoners there, there were taken in North Africa? It's, it's about 50,000 men. That, oh. And the Geneva Convention is very, very specific. Okay. When you take prisoners, they must be accorded the same housing, medical care, um, food and, and accommodations that the soldiers of the combatant nation who captured them are accorded. Okay. And when you look at Africa in the 1940s after the ravages of the battles that have been fought there. And this is there, North Africa. North Africa. There are no places to house these prisoners okay. that, so are, that, that meet the international standard. 
So to begin with, it wasn't like we said, oh, okay, let's do this. It was a situation where in order to really comply with the international law, we had to find a way to take this enormous number of prisoners and essentially take pretty good care of them. And mm -hmm. not everybody does that, but we did. So what did Eisenhower, how did he figure this out? Well, in taking a look with Africa not being an option, and of course the continent of Europe was not an option mm -hmm. at the time, and if you think about it, England was not an option. Oh, no. Uh, because the invasion force is being mm -hmm. built there, and certainly we don't want to have prisoners in that complication. Mm -hmm. But we were bringing ship after ship after shipload of supplies to England mm -hmm. that were returning to the United States empty, cargo ships. Okay. So General Eisenhower made the recommendation that we house those prisoners back here in the United States because it was a convenient way to transport them back to the United mm -hmm. States. And so the United States set up the, all of the infrastructure, most of which was in the southeast of the United States. So Kentucky, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi become the locations where these prisoners are distributed. Very interesting. So when you say distributed, they came in on trains or? They came in on the ships to the east coast of the United States and then they were loaded onto trains and brought to many of these mobilization camps. Okay. Like Camp Campbell, it was determined that 3,000 prisoners could be accommodated mm -hmm. here. 3,000, so, I mean, that's a goodly number of. It sure is. That is a goodly number. And uh, so they came by train and, and some of the stories that we've come across, uh, we do know that the last stop that the train Sighting that it was pulled over to to make the connection down to to Camp Campbell was in Princeton, Kentucky, and it became uh, a, a, a habit for the children there when the prisoner trains came in to go out and greet the trains and see the German prisoners, mm -hmm. and uh, stories of young kids being on the train platform and pulling out black combs and holding them up like little Hitler mustaches <laughs> and goose stepping and sieg heiling the prisoners. Uh, in, a juvenile way of tormenting them yep. uh, before they came here. I think most of those prisoners at that time were very glad to be here. Right. Uh, I mean, they had they, been in North Africa. There was no telling what would have happened to them. So they were scooped up and crossed the ocean and wound up. I mean, you could be a lot worse places <laughs> than in the South. Um, they were very lucky folks. Um, and that's kind of funny about the kids, but at the same time, it's very innocent. I mean, when you think about what was happening on the other side of the world to prisoners of war. Yeah, think about the average American child who's seen the Frank Capra films mm -hmm. uh, on Saturday afternoon at the movie matinee mm -hmm. of Hitler with the little mustache and the cartoons in the newspapers. Yeah. They, were, they were mimicking the way the adults were looking at, uh, at right, the events exactly. in Europe and the, the personalities, so it was oh. pretty fun. So the students uh, worked very hard uh, finding out all of that historical background and uh, we were very uh, fortunate in our archives here to have many pictures and stories and uh, from the pictures uh, they thought that maybe building a POW fence or cage, uh, large, um, three large camps were put together mm -hmm. within Camp Campbell, one by our old hospital mm -hmm. and in that compound about a thousand prisoners were there and there are under international laws ways that you can use prisoner labor and one of the ways was in that area um, they took those prisoners that were capable of working in the hospital as dental hygienists and as orderlies in the hospital and so those prisoners housed there had those duties mm -hmm. during the day mm -hmm. and they helped take care of we had about two thousand patients in the hospital most of whom were combat a wounded returning to the United States. And so the administrative care of a 2,000 bed hospital is pretty daunting so that, task. Right. So they were, they were used in, in, in that capacity. Uh, there was another camp that housed about 1,500 uh, closer to gate three um, on, on the camp. And in that location, those prisoners that could be used in the warehouses where the supplies mm -hmm. coming in to support the training of troops here. So the, the food, the uniform, and, the, and those sorts of warehouse items that were coming in. They worked as warehousemen mm -hmm. um, there. And, and from those two camps also, there were a number of prisoners that were used, and, and we'll talk about it in a few minutes, in the local economy, right. uh, supporting dairy farms and the tobacco farms right. and things like that. There was a third camp, and at the third camp, there was a, a small portion of hardcore Nazis that you didn't want, you wanted them separated out of the general uh, and, and, population. You know, just, 
um, when we were talking, the folks that had been fighting in North Africa were not all, as you say, hardcore Nazis. They were, many of these were Eastern Europeans who had been impressed into the German army. And so th there was a difference between uh, a kind of the Nazi mentality and many of just the plain garden variety soldiers. And I think that's what you were talking about with how we were able to utilize some. And then this third group though, you, you, those were the ones that really we would think of more the way we incarcerate people. Correct. And Dr. Thompson covers that in his, his books about men in German uniforms. Mm -hmm. Because they were wearing German uniforms did not mean they were Germans right. in the Nazi army. Uh, many of the men who were taken prisoners during World War II were farting, fighting uh, with the German army, but they had been impressed from the countries of Eastern Europe mm -hmm. and um, maybe were from Austria, Italy, or you know various places. So it wasn't a, a homogeneous group. They right. were much more polyglot, and, and you could divide them out. Uh, and it took a while to learn that. It was not intuitively obvious. The guards learned that over time. Right, and as you see everybody in the same uniform, it does take a while to figure out that these are all individual, different human beings. Um, so your, your researchers, your students, your interns built this display and in this display what we see is, um, tell me about the uniform that they've got on, the, the W. Okay, you, uh, the uniform that you see here, the, the students designed the exhibit. There are okay. things that they wanted to put together that they felt were important 3D artifacts to incorporate. So we, we built the cage and you've seen from the, the, the pictures of the camps, this is pretty much all there was to it. And it mm -hmm. doesn't look in those camps within the camp, don't look different than what you would see uh, in the Great Escape of German Stalags. Right. Uh, pretty uh, rustic. It was the same standard that our soldiers in World War II were living mm -hmm. in. Uh, they didn't have it any better or any worse. But they did have the, uh, the enclosure uh, and they were kept in there during the day and we managed to find some of this great museum barbed wire. Wow. Uh, this is actually just rubber here so nobody can get oh, hurt on it. But it does okay. look like real barbed wire. It does look real. So your students actually designed it and built it or had a little help building yeah, it. Yeah, the, uh, the museum staff helped them. And then uh, the uniform that we were able to find out about, this uh, uniform that the mannequin is wearing here is a pre-World War II Army fatigue uniform, the uniform that you would wear if you were on detail. Okay. It wasn't being used anymore and there was a lot of them in the warehouses. So they, put so they were able to bring it out. So they brought the uniform out and that's what they used. And You could see on the front pants uh, ah, on the, the P and PW, the w. prisoner of war, and you notice on the shirt, on I the shoulder, P and W mm -hmm. on each sleeve, and then on the back uh, would be PW also. Okay. So that was the uniform that they were wearing um, while they were incarcerated. We also have the, uh, the, the, the picture here of the uh, Camp Campbell prisoner of war sweatshirt. Sweatshirt. I mean, yeah, it's like a, the football team. Or it, something. it is. It's, it's a very interesting picture. We haven't found one of those shirts uh -huh. uh, or sweaters. We'd really like to find one. Oh, uh, I'll bet. So the uh, that that is a depiction of of what you would have seen, and you can see we have the large blow up picture there of the guard tower. Mm -hmm. uh, the enclosures right. did have the guard towers oh, around them. Oh, and I see. Them. Uh huh. And there was a particular unit, uh, the 1539th. Uh, prisoner of war camp, a service company uh, that provided the uh, the guards. So uh, huh. there were, that we did have soldiers during the war who, for whatever reason, couldn't deploy overseas right. who could be put who into units like that. So that was one of the units that was here at Camp Campbell, okay. and uh, a lieutenant colonel was uh, in charge of that unit, and they provided the guards. Well, I think that you have some, this is obviously wonderfully done, and I'm delighted that we were able to use Austin P. students to do it. How great that you have that internship program. That they, they, they um, were able to do some digging for us. It's interesting when you have students uh, digging, they sometimes find things, uh, particularly human interest stories, right. where they would say, hey, look at this. Right. So a second part of, of, of putting this together were some of the human interest stories that, that we found. We're going to learn a little bit about what was life really like in a prisoner of war camp right here at Fort Campbell. So apparently there were some different sort of stages of what life was like. Um, at first, they arrived and you were telling me that there were folks who had cultural events and they sang and... 
The, uh, the life of the prisoners, um, first of all, there was the labor that was involved. We've already right. talked about that. They had a full day of, of, of labor. They didn't just sit around in the, right. in the camp. Uh, but they were accorded cultural um, outlets. Um, they had a library. Uh, there were stage productions. Um, they had access to the chaplain and all of those sorts of things. Um, we do uh, know that there was a singing group called the, uh, the Bell Notes. Uh, and that, that they uh, they were quite popular at the and time. You, they were very. Uh, you have a great picture of them. Yeah, they uh, they they did some nice singing. They, there was a camp newspaper that was published uh, in German for the Germans, and then the name of it was Der Neue Weg, the New Way. And you can see from the uh, the sample copy that we have uh, in front of us here, uh, it was um, meant to. Uh, denazify these men mm -hmm. and prepare them for return to their country, which international law required. Mm -hmm. At the end of the war, they must be returned. So there were events in schools and things where they would learn English, they would learn about American democracy, uh, and they would learn um, policing type mm -hmm. skills. And there was the very uh, intention of making sure when these prisoners were returned, they would help rebuild. Uh, Germany, a mm -hmm. denazified Germany. Right. So that picture on the front here with the swastika right. being smashed Smashing in the, the new swastika. way. Right. The stories were all in German. They were all highly edited, of course, but they were all, I came to America when I was 12 years old and I've loved America ever since. Mm -hmm. so it was reinforcing that sense of Nazis are bad and there's a new world coming right. and that they were going to be part of it. So they were, they were trained in that regard. Uh, up until June of 1944, the local community was pretty benign towards the mm -hmm. presence of prisoners here and the, seeing them doing the working mm -hmm. uh, in the fields and the dairy farms and things like that. And if you remember back at that time, we were not taking a lot of casualties. America was still, uh, there was the war in the Pacific, but right. that was about the Japanese. Right. There was the war in Europe and we had fought in North Africa already. The invasion was building up. Mm -hmm. We were losing airmen in the bombing campaign, but that was a relatively small number to what happened beginning with D-Day where the real battles began. And then suddenly in this local area, there are a lot of families with dead and wounded. Uh, so those Germans, uh, the attitude towards them right. changed. It's very remarkable in the paper. The uh, local veterans agencies uh, you know, were putting letters protesting that the German prisoners here were being coddled mm -hmm. compared to what our boys were going through on the beaches of Normandy. Mm -hmm. and there was a, a great deal of resentment against the prisoners um, at the mm -hmm. time. And so th they were withdrawn a little bit mm -hmm. from uh, so much visibility in the, in the local mm -hmm. area because of that. And I think that's understandable. The nature of the war changed in 44 until victory. Absolutely. And you had um, mentioned about the work that they did on dairy farms and farms. And, and we had talked about that a little bit. Um, we know that they did work during the day. And you were explaining to me that actually these prisoners of war could be picked up by a local farmer and a guard and taken to their farm and they would work on their farm all day. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about the difference, as you said, after, after D-Day, when we were really taking losses, these fellows were working the tobacco fields and it was a very loose setup. Um, in, in loose meaning, they didn't, they didn't try to get away. Some did, but came back. You were telling me that they might um, take a two-week vacation. The, uh, the, ex the experience of the German prisoners here in the United States, there was no way for them to return. If they mm -hmm. got out of camp, they weren't motivated to escape from camp to return to Germany. Mm -hmm. And so many of our memories and uh, popular entertainment about American or uh, allied prisoners in Germany, you know, the intent was to escape, mm -hmm. to get back to uh, the war effort mm -hmm. and uh, escape from the, from the Germans. Um, opposite here since there wasn't that opportunity. Exactly. We don't have escaping prisoners. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's also the labor issue. When we look at prisoner labor in Nazi Germany, we're looking at something that's against international law. Prisoners being used as forced labor in war industries. Right. The Geneva Convention says that you can use the labor of prisoners, but it has to be replacing normal peacetime labor that you no longer have because your sons are fighting. And so the we didn't farm have the is a perfect example. Example. Perfect so this is perfectly within international mm -hmm. law. 
Um, a little bit more problematic down in Tennessee and Georgia was using German prisoners in the pine lumbering mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. uh, they were used extensively there and there's, uh, that's a, that came very close to violating mm -hmm. international law. It had to be argued. But in our local area here, a farmer could come to the camp and in the morning pick up eight or ten prisoners and a guard, sign for them, uh, take them back to his farm for the price of two dollars a day and he had to feed them lunch and then have them return to the stockade mm -hmm. in his transportation with the guard by 6.30 that evening. So many of the dairy farms, tobacco farms, and some of the fences that you've seen right. are around this area were done with prisoner labor. Now, occasionally those prisoners would absent themselves. <laughs> absent themselves. Uh, escape, but it wasn't with the intention of leaving. They would. Uh, live on the land, find a farm family to live with, maybe a girlfriend mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of weeks, and once that had played itself out, they would turn themselves back in. Mm -hmm. So although there were prisoner escapes and they were recorded in the paper and people were reminded to look out for these people, they weren't considered dangerous prisoners dangerous. On, yeah. on the run right. or whatever. So um, of all the events, there were, there were five soldiers that were German prisoners that uh, died four from natural causes, and one was shot uh, in Pembroke at the rail station. Uh, somewhat of an unfortunate event. Uh, he was told to halt. He didn't. A relatively new guard shot him, in, and he was the only prisoner mm -hmm. who, who died while incarcerated here from any violence. But uh, with the stories here and the human interest stories that the, the students have dug up, and we already talked about the yeah, prisoners they coming find through. Yeah, great stories. Uh, the, the prisoners coming through Princeton is a great story. Um, one of the stories uh, of people being thrown together, uh, together uh, Frank uh, Bokesh, uh, who was a guard here, uh, assigned to the 1539th Prisoner of War Camp, uh, met a girl in Clarksville, and she happened to be the daughter, Mary Frances, was the daughter of the police chief. And the two of them married. And there's a wonderful picture of them uh, very near their wedding day. Uh, in downtown Clarksville. Of course, Frank was from Ohio, and uh, so the girl from Clarksville left and, and went away with him. Um, the German prisoners were returned, but there were several of them who had such a positive experience uh, after the war that they came back. And uh, one of those uh, prisoners who came back uh, settled in this area, and he was quite a skilled carpenter. And in 1961, he built all of the museum cases that we have here in the uh, Don F. Pratt Museum. He built now, these cases for these the museum. These actual cases were yeah. built by a German prisoner of war years and years after the war. And so he returned here to Clarksville mm -hmm. to live. Wow, <laughs> that is a great story. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's a nice. Built these. Yeah. Ah. And, and they've, been, they've been with us uh, ever since. Um, the, uh, the soldier's life here at the camp and, and camp life uh, included a wonderful picture from Frank, Frank Bokesh's collection. Um, you can see a, a, a little musical quartet. Uh, they called themselves the Camblers. And these were guards. They were guards and uh, they, uh, they were quite talented and, and like the bell notes, uh, they, they were singers and the Camblers appeared on a national radio show on Thanksgiving of 1943, oh. broadcast from Camp Campbell. Ah, uh, that is a great story. Camp. Yeah. And then you had this wonderful letter. Um, the relationship between the guards and the prisoners was um, not, not a hostile one for the most part. And in this letter, I think that really brings it home. Tell us a little bit more about this one. I, I love this. This comes also from uh, Frank and Francis. Um, the uh, letter is written by the German POWs to Francis. Uh, the wife. The wife. Uh, and you can see uh, in the letter here, uh, the prisoners uh, pay high compliment to, uh, to him, to him yeah. as, as being a man who's a, a, a good conversationalist, helping them learn English. Uh, and, and always being, being always a gentleman. Uh -huh. And uh, through uh, him, they uh, had asked her to provide for them some bags of leather, some craft project that they were working on at, at the time. And it's a nice uh, uh, a little intimate look into the history of the relationship it between is. the guards I mean, that, and that the, really the, the prisoners. That the prisoners were asking the guard wife to help procure, as they say, these leather bags uh, to get to them, to give to them. 
um, it does show that the relationship was not what we really think about in terms of prisoner of war camp. So this was a very unique place. And at what point um, did they close and return all the soldiers? What was our time frame? The, uh, by 19, late 1946, mm -hmm. um, they're gone uh, from, from this location. Mm -hmm. Now, international law requires the repatriate, repatriation right. of prisoners. And during that period of time in the immediate aftermath of the war, there are a lot of displaced people in Europe. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the prisoners here are very concerned. There are prisoners, German prisoners, that are being returned and they end up in the hands of the Russians and they disappear forever. Oh. Uh, and but at any rate, the United States and the Allies are going to be very concerned. It's those events that build up and, and lead mm -hmm. to the Cold War at mm -hmm. that period of time make it very precarious for the prisoners here. Uh, what, uh, what happened is a program was followed up on with, with prisoners, and they actually left from here, and they were in Virginia for a period of time, and the United States government took extra effort as prisoners were going back to educate them uh, on democracy and these police mm -hmm. uh, ac activities to be constabulary type people ah. and be returned to the hands of the um, to the, the military governors, uh, mm -hmm. the British, the French, and the American okay. military governors of what's going to become eventually West Germany. Right. So they don't end up in East Germany. And uh, so we did. There was a kind of a caution in returning them. They were returned, but we tried to protect them, essentially. Correct. And, uh, and I think that uh, you take these human interest stories and mm -hmm. you throw them together. Uh, in 1939, there are people living in Germany, people living in Ohio, people living in Clarksville, and all other places who are thrown together here because of the events of the war. Mm -hmm. And it's a big tumbler where they're mixed together and when they're spread out in 1946, their stories have become intertwined and they all come back here and they're, they're now part of the history of Fort Campbell and Clarksville, they Tennessee. They are, um, just like the man who built these cabinets. Indeed. That is an intertwining. This is your history, your heritage, and this has been a great story about these prisoners of war. And it's very interesting about your interns. I'd like for you to take a minute to, to let folks know how, what times the Pratt is open and what the charge is to come, and also a little bit about your internship program. I know we're just right on the edge, the end of the program, but just real quick. The Pratt Museum is open Monday through Saturday from 9.30 to 4.30. There is no admission charge. Uh, you do need to come on to Fort Campbell to visit us. We're glad to have you. The only thing that we ask is that you go to the visitor center at gate four. At gate four, you'll have to get out and uh, in order to get a pass to come on to post, uh, present your driver's license, proof of insurance and registration. And that's very good advice because sometimes people don't have all those. Yeah, and it's not difficult. <laughs> We're glad to have you and the entire staff will get you to the museum and we'd love to have you uh, join us. Our interns that work in the fall and spring semester through Austin P uh, are, they, they must be uh, senior or junior history majors or graphic arts majors uh, at Austin P. They're individually interviewed by Dr. Browder and myself and we hand select six of the best applicants and um, they come into the program and they do great work for us here. Yes, they do. And you know, Excellent. some some of our interns are already working, uh, they've gone on to their professional career. Uh, they've either gone to Middle Tennessee State University for graduate studies in public history mm -hmm. and help promulgate Tennessee history. And uh, we have interns that are working in Nashville at the museums there, particularly Fort Negley, uh, for wonderful. example. Wonderful, so. wonderful. Remember, this is your history. It's all of our heritage. Have you ever been hungry, worried about where you're going to get your next meal? Loaves and Fishes is an organization feeding the hungry. Primarily through volunteer efforts and donations, we are able to accomplish this mission. Loaves and Fishes provides a midday meal Monday through Saturday year-round. We provide food to agencies helping the needy through our distribution program. If you would like to donate, get involved, or for more information, you can find us on the web at www.loavesandfishes.com.
tn.org. Please help us with our mission of feeding the hungry.